about a minute before we officially get started. Tristan, do you have the PowerPoint to pull up or would you like for me to do it? I'm not sure works works best for you. Can you do it uh, just because I've got several other things kind of going on on my computer? Everything crashes because I've got too much going on. That would be sad. I can do that, yes. Tristan, do you see any reason why we cannot go ahead and get started on time? Jesse Julie is joining us. Oh, I don't see any reason we, we can get going. Hey, Julie. Um, are we okay to get started, Julie? Thumbs up. Okay. Welcome again, everybody. Um, <clears throat> appreciate you joining us today. Uh, had a really good discussion last week, which we captured a lot of broad topic areas to, to help us narrow in on. and that we can pass along hopefully in the future as areas we're focusing on. Um, I think everybody with us today has been with us before. Uh, so as we have all become so familiar with Zoom and its wonderful features, just don't forget the chat is there. We do our best to monitor it. Keep yourself muted if you're not speaking. Um, <clears throat> and if you do have a question, it is helpful for me and Eric and Tristan. Uh, if you just hit the raise your hand feature, which is located uh, wherever your toolbar is. Um, if you don't see it, that's fine. We will get back to you. Um, Tristan uh, has asked me a question. Um, what, uh, Tristan, can you give me a little bit more direction? You just need everybody to, to, to say here or not here. Do, do you, yeah. have the list, you have the list of names to call out? I do. Okay, so we're going to do a roll call. So Tristan will call your name. If you are here, just say here. All right, Christine Egger. Christine Egger. She's here. Oh, okay. Dean Jardine. I am here. Erica Allen. I am here. John Mellick. Here. Julie Walker. I, I apologize. It's Jewel Walker. Jewel's picture is here. Um. <laughs> Chad. I, Jewel is here. I'm present, but I'm currently on the phone. I apologize. No worries, Jewel. Thank you. Nicole Flynn. Here. Mike Perry. Aloha from sunny Honolulu. <laughs> Nick Schumacher. Well, hello from sunny Southeast Montana. Philip Corbett. Present. Al Fowler. I'm here. Angela McLean. Good afternoon here. And Sharon Carroll. Good afternoon. Here. Diane Fladmo. Hello from Hazy Helena. And then we've got Eric Spotter. Here. Hi, everyone. And Jacob Williams. Here. And me. Hey, Tristan. <clears throat> Good to see you. So. All right, thanks for that. Um, have that documented. We do such a great job working together as we move forward. Everybody still remember that we want to be respectful, be supportive, be present, and be open to new ideas and make sure that we um, are the best listeners that we can be as our colleagues present their ideas and information today. Uh, we will reach a decision if we, we will not 
utilize this today as we're still hearing from our groups who did the work, but if we make recommendations or substantive changes, then we will move those forward by roll call vote of a, and a supermajority allows us to move forward with that as a recommendation from the task force. All right, so on the 26th, the feedback group, uh, which we discussed is the group of stakeholders who had expressed interest in being on the task force group but were not selected, uh, did meet and had a great discussion. So we captured some notes from that discussion to pass along to you. Uh, Eric was there, I was unable to attend. So Eric will give us the overview. Eric, you give me directions as to what you need me to do and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yes, and Tristan was there as well. Uh, thank you, Tristan, for all you're doing to support not only the two Chapter 57 groups that are meeting, but also Chapter 58. But uh, if I get any of this wrong from what we talked about on Monday, feel free to chime in. Uh, so the feedback group, just to remind everyone, is a separate group uh, that meets just once a month uh, or has met once a month so far over the summer, just to review the work that all of you are doing and uh, just provide additional thoughts and suggestions. They are uh, really just observers to the process. They're composed of people that wanted to be part of the task force process, but because we had to limit participation and there just was not enough space um, to include everyone and it would be unwieldy to facilitate an online engagement process like this with a very large group of people. Um, um, the choice was made to have you all uh, serve in the main task force, but that this feedback group would uh, be an additional way for OPI to engage others. Um, and of course, in addition to additional public comment um, that will be available through the Board of Public Ed's process later the, this fall. So um, this other group does not make decisions. They do not do work. Um, all of you are the ones that are the deciders, so to speak, in terms of uh, making recommendations for the superintendent to put forward to the board. But that said, you know, just in case we miss something, um, or there's additional suggestions out there that would be helpful for the task force. Um, we are glad for the opportunity and for OPI running these additional groups. And just to share with you all some highlights of what they shared. So we presented to them your uh, recommendation to reopen the counselor to administrator pathway and also the suggested language revisions uh, that you all proposed. Um, and so we got a little bit of feedback on that, as you might expect, um, for a group that has met less frequently and is not as deeply involved as all of you are in all the discussions. Sometimes their questions or things they brought up were uh, a little bit repetitive of conversations we've already had. Um, so along those lines, there was a question around how counselors are prepared. So just as we did in our group, we reviewed the requirements for the class six specialist license for school counselors, talking about their requirement to have a master's degree, a certain number of hours of experience. Um, there was also a comment or a couple of comments about similar to what we discussed and we considered uh, here in this group that if counselors might lack experience in all facets of work that teachers do, such as planning lessons and schedules, teaching in the classroom, talking with parents. Um, so we answered this or we noted, and, and the example the person shared um, was a high school guidance counselor. If all they're doing is helping high school students take courses and prepare for college, would they necessarily be positioned to take on a school administrator position? Um, you know, the discussion raised the fact that, that that's a very specialized use of a counselor and something you're more likely to find in larger districts, in smaller districts or smaller schools where many people are wearing different hats, it's more likely a counselor there 
may have a little more of the experience analogous or similar to what classroom teachers have. We also discussed how ultimately it's up to the, the district to decide if a uh, administrator candidate has the experience uh, specific that the district is looking for. So even though this pathway is open, it does not guarantee that someone who follows that pathway is placed in a position because that choice is ultimately left to the district. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Jacob. Um, so after that, we talked about the work you all did within the reciprocity realm and uh, some of the additional or some of the initial discussions uh, that came out of your conversation so far uh, and asked them to, we showed them the table of the big buckets and asked if they had any ideas or comments on what was on the screen or things for you all to consider. Um, so some feedback that came in around coursework uh, was looking at it at language around um, requiring coursework from a Montana institution or other, any other hoops related to coursework. Um, along those lines, there was a suggestion similar to what some of you were talking about last week. Would Could that six credit requirement, um, could someone obtain those or their equivalent through some other means? Um, someone connected, as I think one of you did, how there's the renewal system for licenses and could renewal credits or could courses on the teacher learning hub um, be used to help someone get to those six credits. We also talked about how you all discussed the potential for uh, educator preparation programs, colleges and universities in Montana to, op to offer some sort of specialized fast track um, preparation that would help them get to these credits, but would not require the traditional load. Um, and seat time to get six credits. Uh, they talked about, or the feedback group talked about the AIFA course requirement, but as you have discussed, that's an important and distinctive piece that has value in Montana. Um, so no desire to change it. Um, and in fact, they see it as a potential good model for potentially helping candidates get some of that recency or um, course credit requirement. If it could be offered similar to the IEFA course in that it's free, it's only two hours, and then it's offered online. So anyone with a good internet connection in the, across the state can take that required course. If you want to go to the next slide, Jacob. Um, there was some discussion similar to what we had last week around the five versus three years of experience. Uh, it was noted that caution might be needed there, that extra two years, at least as that group understood it, came from um, concern around teachers from alternative preparation programs. Um, and the added two years was meant to fill either an experienced or perceived gap for those alternatively prepared educators. So just so a note of caution there. Um, similar to some of you, there's some skepticism about requiring experienced teachers to take the praxis test. Um, at the same time, how do you ensure that even if a teacher has had experience, they're up to date on current content and pedagogy? Uh, so one suggestion was, or one comment was, perhaps the praxis is required for a class two license, but is not required for the class one license. They did talk about, and we haven't talked about yet, and maybe we'll get to it today, the special reciprocity for advanced credentials. There was a concern that teaching uh, college students or adult learners is different from teaching K-12 students. So perhaps someone with a PhD, just as one example, maybe they get a pass on content, but not necessarily a free pass on pedagogy. They need to be prepared to teach a different type and context of learning than uh, a higher ed setting. And then that might've been it. 
Okay. Uh, they also had some suggestions and feedback around endorsements, which maybe we might get to today as well in this group. But um, just looking at a couple of the endorsement areas, and I know Julie knows a lot about this and has uh, and reported last week on some concerns around this or some common occurrences that her staff see in the licensure department. But just noting that Montana has some broad endorsement areas that districts appreciate um, for Montana licensed teachers. It gives them more flexibility to fill positions. It may be challenging for out-of-state teachers who have endorsements that are more narrowly defined. So a middle school math teacher from out-of-state, for example, it would be hard to figure out how to place him or her. And then we just reviewed the task force, so your schedule and their schedule, just so they could understand the process as it unfolds. So possibly some inputs for our conversation today, or just you know some observation of your work based on um, the thoughts of folks who are kind of sitting, watching you do all the good work that you're doing. And I think that was it for the feedback group. Tristan, did I miss anything? No, I just wanted to point out their next meeting is the 16th, not the 19th. Okay, my apologies. No, you're just fine. <clears throat> so yes, they're, they're only scheduled to meet one more time in August. I suppose potentially they could meet again, depending on how the task force schedule uh, plays out after August. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, we hope and will, I'm confident that we will hear from each of our groups around those different bucket areas where we got that input. Um, and before you do that, I sorry, Jacob, I just see Dan asked a question. So yes, um, Tristan just finished up today uh, notes from that feedback group. And I think, did you, and if you haven't already, I'm sure Tristan, you'll put it on the Google site for this group. Yes, it'll be... Uh, posted on the Google site. There's a feedback group drop down column like there is for your guys' sessions. Uh, they're recording minutes and the summary will be there. Is it up there currently or will it? No, be not yet. Not okay. yet. Is it possible to share it some way during this meeting? I think I read Dan's comment and correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, that he felt it might be useful to see while we were having our conversation today. Um, yes, I just, I usually get it approved before okay. I post it. Um, we can circle back to it on the slide if necessary, Dan, is that uh, is um, on record, but not yet approved for posting. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to slide back to one of those if we're in one of those specific areas having a chat to see uh, what the feedback was. And uh, we can burden Eric with uh, keeping his ear to the conversation to see if there's anything relevant from that feedback group that might uh, fit in too, and he can help us make that connection as we have our conversation. So our goals for today is we want to hear from the rest of the subcommittees around those big bucket areas. Last week, we had a really rich discussion around coursework um, and really took the majority of our time. Uh, we then want to circle back to that discussion from last week as we wrap up today and start to really begin to affirm some emerging areas of consensus and clarify some issues and then think about what are our next steps. Uh, and so, Sean, I, I think we certainly are going to circle back to this coursework piece today, but there is language uh, that talks about a Montana institution that I think we'll circle back to today and want to dig a little deeper into. So, um, but I do want to make sure we give a time to our other committees that have not presented yet so we can hear from them before we get back to the coursework piece. Angela, you had your hand up. Did you have something you want to jump in? I just have a comment. Um, it sounds like there was an interesting EFA course with the subcommittee. And if I recall correctly, I think the EFA course was brought up as piece of a, of, a, of a conversation around something that we require. And uh, it was mentioned along other courses for school administrators. 
for example, uh, school law, school finance, collective bargaining. Um, as, as you know, these are pieces of things that we require people to have. And I think that it was part of a bigger conversation in saying not to remove EFA at all, but I think what it was part of was to say, can we take those 60 renewal units or six credits and put more thought behind what they were? Not to remove anything, but I think, I think that that got lost. I think what we were talking about there is that we have these 60 renewal units, we have these six credits, um, and maybe we could be more prescriptive in what those are, like we are prescriptive with EFA, like we are prescriptive with our school administrators and what they might have. So I think that might have been lost maybe throughout the hour and a half of conversation. But I, if I recall correctly, I think that was the presentation of that. Not to, not to take it out of any areas of licensure. Yes, that's correct. And the, the feedback group, I totally endorse what you're saying. AIFA is here to stay. Don't change it. It's important, you know, that that's part of the constitution. Um, that that piece of Montana's history, past and present, uh, be included. So the feedback group, I would say, ratified your observation that that's an important piece to keep. Um, and I think where some concern arose was just in the way that um, the reciprocity report kind of takes findings from the NCTQ report. So the NCTQ report kind of says, you know, maybe generally states shouldn't require additional coursework for out of state teachers. But, uh, you know, there are exceptions, and that is one of them. And that it's, it's clear that uh, the IEFA course is one that has value and everyone agrees is important. So I don't think you need to worry about anyone recommending that go that piece go away. Thank you. And I, I remember the same thing from our discussion last week too, they said being uh, well established. I think um, we could, again, we'll circle back, but I, I felt like we had some consensus in our conversation with what we heard from the feedback group too. So <clears throat> we are ready today though, to hear from the assessments group. Uh, and so uh, Tristan and Eric, since I am sharing my screen, if you could help me out with who's in that group. Uh, if you are in the assessment group, we'd love to hear a conversation. Feel free to go ahead and jump into the conversation without me calling on you, but I am unaware who the group is at this point. It's downsized and unable to get to it. Nick, go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Jacob. Um, Mike Perry and uh, Christine Egger and I uh, worked on the, on the assessments, uh, big bucket uh, comments here. Uh, bear with me, we did this uh, about 10 days ago and I'm working off of uh, some notes from that day. Uh, but, but really, we started with uh, digging down into what, uh, what the praxis is and what it's used for. Um, you know, I think uh, you know, ETS is very clear that, uh, that the praxis is a, uh, it's a content knowledge test um, and that the praxis is used in uh, 40 different states uh, across the nation. Uh, looks like there are 43 states that require some manner of content knowledge assessment. Um, so when we're looking at that, you know, we're looking at uh, 80 plus percent of the uh, teachers across the nation, uh, the certificated teachers across the nation, uh, likely have shown some manner of mastery in their content. Um, so that's a, a, a pretty big piece as we circle back around to uh, our takeaways from this discussion. Um, looking at the ETS uh, uh, website and what's available to them, uh, there is a test for pedagogy, uh, but our understanding is that uh, that pedagogy test is not, uh, is not used in Montana or is not used for lic licensure, I, sh I should say, rather. Um, through our discussion and, and really uh, uh, through some of the, uh, the stories that we've heard uh, recently and over the years about, uh, about teacher licensure and uh, um, you know, teachers that have uh, worked out and those that haven't, uh, really the discussion revolves around the pedagogy rather than the content knowledge. Um, you know, it's, uh, 
in in our group specifically, you know, if we had a uh, if we had our choice between somebody with some mad chops in the classroom rather than somebody that's a content knowledge master, um, we would certainly prefer someone with a mastery of pedagogy. Um, all that said, uh, our recommendation, uh, if we're if we're allowed to make one. Um, is that uh, when we look at the praxis test, that it would be very nice to use the praxis for licensure for someone that is a first time United States teaching license holder. Um, and then we'd, uh, you know, we would, we would include subject area or endorsement area on that. Um, so example being, uh, we would not, uh, we would not require a passing score on the praxis test for a teacher, a teacher of mathematics licensed in the, the state of Iowa and South Dakota um, trying to come here, um, we would not require them to produce another uh, passing praxis score. Uh, really, uh, we, we would support the use of the praxis um, Wherever, wherever a teacher is looking to add an endorsement area, wherever they're looking uh, um, to have a first license in, uh, in their career. Um, it, and really the, uh, the, the rationale of that is uh, back to that plus 80% of uh, certificated teachers um, have, have shown some manner of mastery of content knowledge already. And uh, in order to uh, eliminate that redundancy, you know, we uh, we we support um, using the praxis for first-time license, uh, whether that's in Montana or another state. Um, you know, the other uh, the other contingent to that, um, you know, we've all uh, we've all had teachers that come in with uh, you know twenty years of experience but no praxis test. Um, and they're unable to be licensed uh, due to that. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, those were our major takeaways from uh, Dr. Perry and, uh, and uh, Christine Eggers. Um, if anybody else is on uh, out of this group, uh, like I say, I'm working off of 10 day old notes here. If there's anything that I, I missed or misrepresented, uh, please feel free to help us out. And I agree with you entirely, Nick. I know that the comment was made several times, the test would take place of having to take extra courses for the degree. We, we feel like if they take the test, that should prove they are qualified to do what we are asking them to do if they, if they pass that. Yes, thank you, Christine. Mike, are you uh, are you on or are you on the beach, or both? I'm on. Haven't headed to the beach yet. <laughs> um, I, you know, you've got it spot on. Just a lot of the stories. You know, if they've come out with a degree in, as Nick said, mathematics from a from a U.S. institution, we're assuming that they've got the content down. And again, choosing between content and pedagogy um, is a no-brainer for most of us, especially in smaller schools. We need that pedagogy uh, rather than the content. So if someone's already certified in Idaho and they're trying to come and get a license, why are we having them take a content test? It just didn't make sense to us. I think we also discussed the fact that if you have someone who's got who's been in the field, not in education, and they have a content mastery because they've been an MBA or something like that. If they could take the praxis and show that they have that mastery, then we know they only have to get the pedagogy and it's not specific courses that they need because they've proven they know the content.
So uh, if I can summarize what I heard was uh, the praxis has relevance for pre-service teachers, but not for teachers who have already been licensed in other states and potentially relevance for those who may be coming from another field that is not education. The praxis content test, is that correct? I think that's an accurate summary. Yes, thank you. Angela, were you gonna jump in? I saw you popped up on my screen. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this conversation. Um, do we have any um, praxis data, uh, anything that would show us if the praxis uh, is a barrier and who it's a barrier for? Um, I do like the idea um, of assessing for pedagogy. I think that is, um, really an interesting idea here. Um, but I, I'd like to know a little bit more about what we see with our existing structure and what data we might have around uh, whether or not it's a barrier or has been. I would say, Angela, this is Julie. We do have a special class of license called a 5A. Um, and that's to give a, a teacher one year to take and pass the praxis if they meet other, all the other requirements. Um, and so if I take a look at and see how many folks did that impact, meaning that they needed that one requirement um, in order for them to get the license, um, I'm gonna pull that up for you guys, okay? just to show you how much, uh, how many folks did benefit from that this last year um, of licensure. I would say, Angela, like we do have numbers of folks uh, with the praxis and some data on it that I could definitely pull together and get to this group. Um, and so we do have data on praxis results, if you will. Um, I would also tell you that, um, there's a different system used for in-state candidates than out-of-state candidates when it comes to the praxis. They use what they call the MAC system. In you know, Angela, probably this better than I do, um, but that's like a pretty, um, uh, it's almost like a, a, a multiple ways uh, portfolio, if you will, of someone being able to demonstrate knowledge through their CPA, or classroom-based assessments at the university, and then the praxis. So you could uh, not pass the praxis at our universities and maybe get, you know, um, two points here, and then you know have a really high GPA and really good on your your classroom-based assessments at the university, and still um, be qualified for licensure. But that's not the case for out-of-state folks. If you don't pass the praxis, then you can't get your licensure. Um, and then we'd give you one year um, in order for you to do that. So I do think I just wanna bring that forward because I think there's a different standard there for folks who um, attend a state school versus folks who are, do not attend Montana state schools. It's just a, it's a question there that comes up. Um, and then Dan put something in the, in the box there that he's had personal experiences with folks not passing the, the praxis. So um, I'm gonna look at that number to see how many people benefited from the 5A, um, but I can get some more data. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Dan, did you wanna say something? And then after Dan, John, will get to you. Or were you just good with the chat message, Dan? Just wanted to give you the floor if you wanted it. I, I, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, good. All right, so uh, what I was going to say is that um, this relates more back to the pedagogy being more important than the content, uh, especially elementary education, um, uh, you know, in order for us to fill, uh, well, to fill out our, our, our actual teacher rosters, you know, and utilizing um, J-1 visa teachers. So what happens is that you have a tremendous amount of, of, of competency 
coming from, uh, you know, a foreign country with someone who has, you know, 10, 15 years of education, um, but still may struggle with the language barrier in taking the praxis test. Now, even though they can function very well in the classroom or whatever, uh, as a staff member with the English language, um, having the praxis test limited to, uh, you know, its, its delivery um, does not necessarily give the picture then uh, of, a, of a way to test someone who may find, you know, a, a barrier with the English language. So that being said, I think it's very important to say that, you know, I would much rather have the pedagogy than the content knowledge because the content knowledge certainly follows straight through um, with, with the ability to actually be a good teacher first. You know, someone who can uh, form relationships and, and, and develop a sense of belonging with students is much more highly regarded in our school system than content knowledge, which you can pick up and use and bolter, bolster in a number of different ways. That's what I was going to say. John? Yeah, I just wanted to add a, a couple little things. Um, the 5A has been a, a, a really good addition to the, the class five for people who need to pass that practice exam. Um, Montana graduates are in that 5A as well. So when we have a candidate who graduates but doesn't pass the exam, um, they'll be in that 5A data. So um, hopefully Julie can suss that out where those folks aren't in there. Um, she was speaking about the MAC and the, the MAC is what we all use when we recommend someone for licensure. And you have to have seven points on that MAC. Four come from your GPA, three come from your uh, cooperating teacher evaluating your content knowledge when you student teach, and three points are, are from um, the praxis. Uh, if someone doesn't uh, get a two in one of those areas, they're not considered passing. And so if someone doesn't pass the praxis, uh, we won't recommend them for licensure. Um, although technically we could, if they had a four and a three in the other area, they have their seven points. Um, but as a matter of practice, we, we don't pass them through. Um, I, this idea about the pedagogy test, I think if you look back to some of the data that you collected, even our graduates, our own graduates, talked about the need for more focus on pedagogy. So the MAC was actually developed under the highly qualified rules, which have been gone for many, many years. And so as part of this assessment, if there was something that could be done, not just for out-of-state candidates, but also for our in-state um, uh, graduates looking at that MAC form and how we recommend people, uh, might be a nice time to do that. Um, I talk to a lot of principals on a regular basis, and I will tell you that in, in our area and in the in out of area that we talk to principals across the state, we hear the exact same thing that you're hearing. Um, we, we, when we hire people, we're looking for people who can teach. We can teach them content, brush up that content, but we can't take someone who has terrific content knowledge and doesn't get kids to learn how to teach kids. And so uh, I, I just wanted to really reiterate what other folks are saying, uh, share a little bit more about that, Mac. And then, um, uh, and again, I would, would praise OPI for the 5A. It, it's been a really great uh, addition to the licensure process. And um, if we could add that, that Mac possibly is something for our in-state candidates to have a discussion about assessment for our folks too, not just out of state. I think that would be a beneficial discussion. Thank you, John. Nick, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, John, uh, that was very, very, very well said. Thank you. Um, uh, one question, uh, Julie put uh, um, that there were 89 5A uh, license recipients in school year 2021, um, which, uh, you know, that's, that's a wonderful option and very thankful to have that. Uh, but then what's the, uh, how many of those teachers are, are under contract to teach in school year 21-22? Meaning, um, did they 
did they eventually pass the praxis or, and we've experienced this, did they just give up on jumping through the hoops? Um, so that would be a that would be an interesting number for me uh, to see how many of those eighty nine um, are still are still under contract in Montana. Thank you, Nick. So, uh, Sean, to your comment and to I think your question, Nick, uh, there was a report released in the last couple of weeks uh, from the National Council of Teacher Quality that looked at uh, pass rates of the praxis for um, pre-service teachers. So their first attempt. Montana was not included in the report. Um, their data was not included, but I, I, it definitely varied by state. Uh, the three things that this report looked at was first time pass rate, uh, best attempt pass rate, being like how many people eventually passed it regardless, uh, and walk away rate, right? So uh, two states, for example, uh, Idaho, had a first time pass attempt of 56 percent so it means only i think i think that number is right is in the 50s uh, definitely that varied by institution within the state their best attempt pass rate was in the high 80s and it was about one in six candidates who eventually just walked away and never never took it again um, nebraska on the other hand was in the 90s at both best attempt and first att first attempt and their walk away rate was one in five so it was a little bit higher um, but uh, they think there was 38 states included in that report, but not Montana. So the gist is it varies. <laughs> so it's hard to say uh, uh, for sure in Montana, but it's certainly these assessments and have to how Dan spoke been identified as potential barriers for those who um, may not be native English speakers to pass. Or good test takers, um, we, yeah, you know, in in public education, we hopefully all moved past the the only way to to show mastery of content is through a test. Um, with all the efforts towards trans transformational learning, um, you know, when we look at our students, there's more than one way to show show mastery. But other than the max with the uh, university system, I'm not sure if we if we have that. So, Dean, you asked a question, um, and maybe Julie has an understanding of this. I do not know why Montana was not included in the report, nor do I know if that data would be available. Julie, do you know if that, like the pass rate from Praxis, is available? Um, yes, I can get that data. It's just going to take me, a, you know, a little bit of time. I know we put in a request to get that data from Praxis so that we could report it, but I don't think um, we got it back in time to meet the report. So I know that um, you can request it back from Praxis, right, and get that information. And um, I need to check back and see uh, where that's at. I need to follow up on that. That was a couple of weeks. Uh, a couple of months ago, maybe eight weeks ago. I don't know, you guys, time's flying, but I can get you the data. <laughs> Any other comments about assessment? Sean, go ahead, please. Yeah, hey, uh, just a, uh, let's see, though, put my hand down. I think I've got that now. Okay. Um, okay, so the question was around. Um, let me scroll back up here on that. The so 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 is this seen as a barrier or not? I, I'm not sure I followed the, the conversation piece around that, and I'm not sure I, I I understood where the end point or end game was around around those stats and those numbers that you provided. Uh, do you see this then as the with the walk away rate as in one in five or one in six? Would, would do you see that do you see would you and do you see that as a barrier or not and the other stats around that as well are you asking me specifically uh, anybody like, who wants to I'd, like, I'd like to hear from the group yeah <laughs> go ahead john 
well, I don't have as much experience as a lot of the administrators in, in talking to these folks on the other end, but we do uh, from time to time hear from, from folks who are coming into Montana and um, definitely for someone I think who's been licensed in another state, um, it, it, it often, it, it, it's a, it's a barrier in the fact that they don't understand why they would have to take the same course a college recent college graduate has to take when they have 15 years of uh, successful teaching experience. And so I think that differentiator that was mentioned earlier, if they're licensed in another state, we would look at that differently than if they had completed a program in another state, but not achieved uh, that initial licensure. And so I think that differentiator is pretty important. A follow up. So is that? I'm, I'm, I, my apologies, um, but a follow up is: Do the does the reciprocity piece require the praxis praxis? For, for everybody coming from out of state. Is that what I'm, am I reading that correctly or not? They must show a praxis, right? So it's possible that some teachers from out of state had not taken it. And so if they had not taken it, then they would have to take it. But if they had a documented score, then that's sufficient. Someone please tell me if that's incorrect. So every, um, so Sean, every, out-of-state teacher that applies to Montana must pass and pass, must take and pass the praxis and have a score from within the last 10 years. Okay, so so John, so to John's point then, we have people coming in, or, or a few people at least coming in from out of state that hasn't that haven't taken the praxis and they have 15 years of experience, for instance, and we still require that. So they don't understand why they're being required to do this. And so they walk away. Yes. That's too bad. Thank you. Thank you for humoring me. Yes, yeah, so this is this is Cheryl. Um, the we seem to have lost Cheryl. I'm going to Erica. You have your hand up, and then Christine will go after that, and then maybe Cheryl can join us again after after you speak, Erica. So I was just curious, and you may have addressed this already, but um, is there information or questions on the practice that is specific to Montana? as opposed to just general knowledge? Would anybody like to respond to that? Specific questions to Montana on the praxis? Um, so can you repeat the question one more time just so that I get it correctly? Are there specific questions on these tests for Montana? Is that the question, Jacob? So, so to Montana standards or anything about Montana that would be different than another state, I guess what I'm asking. No, they're um, not state specific. There's no state specific questions on them. They're um, just like they have one <clears throat> content test for like math, one content test for um, K-8 elementary, one content test for, you know, chemistry. Their national ETS has their national test. There's nothing in there unique or specific to uh, the standards, if you will. Um, and they're based upon solely content. If you, there's no questions in there on pedagogy as well. Cheryl, are you back with us? Yes, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Just briefly for a moment as, as we continue down this path, it's really important to understand that there is no evidence that the praxis does anything to identify the quality or effectiveness of a teacher. So all it is is simply a barrier and I would really challenge you to 
consistently ask yourself the question, why do we need the praxis in Montana, much less any other state? I can share with you that Nevada is already looking at uh, other options by which teachers demonstrate their effectiveness than taking a test. Um, so I think it's really important that, that we understand there is no evidence that supports the praxis has any measure of teacher quality or effectiveness. Christine. That ties right into what I was thinking. Our group discussed the fact that there are tests besides the praxis given in other states as well, and that not everybody uses the praxis. So I think Cheryl hit the nail right on the head. We're, we're trying to determine an effectiveness by a, just one test. And I'm not sure that that's our best choice, but we do need to try to find a path that allows people who have uh, teaching skill to be able to get and, and teach in our state more easily. Thank you, Christine. Jacob, I just yes. want to share like an email that I read last night in the um, email box for licensure, because I think it really summarizes up what this group um, kind of came out with from Schumacher. So I just want to share it with you. She says, um, uh, I'm reaching out at the direction of a representative I just spoke to on the phone. I've been the spouse of an active duty soldier in the US Army for the past 13 years. As such, I've held teaching licenses in three different states, Michigan, Georgia, and North Carolina. I'm having great difficulty switching my K-12 music teaching license to the state of Montana. I'm told that despite having attained a bachelor's degree and teaching certificate from the University of Michigan and a master's degree from, the Boston, from Boston University, in addition to my three years of public school teaching experiences that I will also need to resit for a praxis exam. I've been offered a teaching position this fall and it is my understanding that I'll be given a provisional license and will have one year to complete this praxis requirement. I appreciate the efforts you are taking to maintain high standards in terms of the quality of education you provide to your students. However, I'm frustrated with the lack of uh, Montana's lack of reciprocity. For example, I've been told I need to submit out of state licensure history forms from each state I've held a license in. In addition to submitting verification of program experience. Um, and she just kind of goes on to say, and now I got to spend more time on paperwork and take a test. Um, I'm getting, I'm happy to do all these things, but I was told to reach out to, um, and see if there might be any assistance you could provide me in this matter. And you guys, this is not unusual to see a message like this in the email box at the OPI two to three times a week. Thank you, Julie. And it also touches on our potential barriers for military spouses as well. Sean, go ahead. Sean, did you have something you wanted to say? There we go. There we go. I have to figure out how to turn it, turn the mic on again. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, Julie, thank you very much for reading that email. That that really kind of sheds light on on the problem, and and so. I think part of what I feel our goal is to identify problems and define solutions. And, and the praxis certainly seems to be a significant barrier. Uh, if, if Nevada is, and I think I recall that state correctly, if Nevada is considering uh, just uh, not requiring the praxis, um, I think that's something we probably should really actually consider here. The, you know, and, and, and the kind of the end game around this, in my mind too, is, is local control. And that, and that, of course, we need a licensure piece of this, but you know, superintendents and administration and boards 
uh, which which this all ends up at, you know, in their, um, you know, at, at their desks, they'll be hiring teachers that they think are qualified, that are good fits, that that are viable, um, you, you know, and so so some of this really goes back into regardless of taking a practice or not, uh, some of this goes back into to um, you know back to their roles in those positions that actually hire people. So I just wanted to kind of you know share that a little bit as well. So so thank you very much. Now, did you want to say something? You just popped up on my screen. Yeah, I did um, because I'm I'm on the military spouse um, bucket. Um, I I'm I'm hearing or I'm I guess I'm feeling the same way about this whole thing is that just because you hold a license does not mean that you're going to get hired. Um, and I mean, I don't want like just a, a license spitting out factory. I, I totally am not for that. But what I feel is that email just hit it right on the head for me is if, if she's, she's taught in three different states, even if she's just taught in one state, um, if she has the experience and she comes either recommended or I mean, she's already passed all of her tests. She's already student taught. She already has the, the pedagogy down. She graduated from college. I'm assuming that she would have that down. I think everything that we're putting forth is just barriers. And, and I hear her and I feel for her. Uh, the reason I, I took on this bucket was because I my daughter is a military spouse um, and she's in the health field, well, dental hygiene, and she's lucky because she went to Missouri and her Montana and California license transferred to Missouri. So she was lucky in that. But with Montana, if I'm hearing correctly that we're having the teacher shortage or we're needing more teachers, any barrier that we can take away that would not hurt our children would be, would be a good thing. Um, and the people that are hiring, I, my superintendent is not gonna hire somebody who's going to hurt our children. So I go back to local control being on a school board for 23 years, um, it's local control. And if we think that that's a good fit and they're going to be great for our students, we should have, we should be able to do that. I, I just feel like a license with some hardship is just not benefiting our students. There you go. There's my spiel. Well, was there anything else that, while we're on the military spouses, Val, and you have the floor, anything else from your group discussion that's pertinent at this point? Uh, well, you could, you just caught me when my computer just died, but if I can go back from memory, I found, um, actually, I found one and my partner, Phil, found exactly the same thing, only ours, mine's just a little bit different. Um, and I had it up in the the committee reports up there. there I put a link in there um, and hold on a second, just let me pull this up. Um, I pasted it to a Word document and I tried to post it into the uh, committee report bucket list, but I can't get access for some reason. Um, but this came from the US Department of Defense and it's a quote, um, barriers to the transfer and acceptance of cert cert certifications and licenses that occur when state rules differ can have a dramatic and negative effect on financial well-being of military families. And I see that a lot. There's usually two incomes in military families. Otherwise, they can qualify for all kinds of assistance. Um, it says removing these barriers, creating reciprocity and licensing requirements, and facilitating placement opportunities can help a military's family financial, st financial stability, um, speed the assimilation of the family into their new location, and, cre and also create new employee pool for the state, especially in the education and healthcare field. Um, I thought that was pretty impressive coming from the US Department of Defense that they're actually calling it barriers. And that's our committee is trying to remove barriers. So. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, other than that, unless uh, Phil wants to add, I, I can't, I'm not seeing on the reports that you have up, um, up on the screen there. I, we had some other things on there, maybe some recommendations, but I, we're just in, I think we're just in agreement that the, the more that we can lessen the barriers the better it is going to be for Montana kids. 
kind of it in a nutshell. Thank you, Val. Uh, John, you put your hand up. I just had uh, uh, two things. One is uh, specifically around um, spouses of, of military personnel. Um, NASDAQ, who has the interstate agreement, uh, is in the very early stages of uh, discussions of creating a, uh, a different type of reciprocity um, kind of at, at a higher level where states would actually work with each other and, and this was driven primarily because of, of spouses of, of military personnel. And so they, the, this is something that's on their radar. It seems like this would be something that'd be very timely to make sure that we're at the table for these discussions. Um, and so what they wanna do is instead of having a blanket uh, interstate agreement act. And so the, the interstate agreement act right now basically says, if you have a license in another state, you move to another state, you get essentially would be our class 5a um, or class 5 and you meet whatever requirements that state has in place what they'd like to switch to where states would agree ahead of time um, that if you come from a certain state and go to another state that the license you you have a license automatically when you come in so um, the national licensing directors of uh, they're, they're working on this too um, so be making sure we have a seat at that table and then um, one of the things I'd be curious about um, was, was Cheryl's comment uh, about the praxis, and, and I'm not arguing uh, one way or the other, um, uh, but the Education Commission of States, I think they could provide an analysis of states who have eliminated the content knowledge assessment and, and perhaps what they've done instead. Um, you know, there, there likely are other things that can be done besides a praxis. And I think that, again, has a bigger impact than just teachers coming in from out of state, but maybe that has some really good ramifications for our programs as well, uh, where we could do some things differently. Um, again, the, the big push on testing came from the Highly Qualified Act in the early 2000s, and we're no longer under those requirements. Uh, you know, we, we've moved away from, from that Highly Qualified um, uh, designation. So, um, I think these are great discussions to have, and there might be some places where we could get some data about what other states are doing and what that looks like to help kind of think through what could, what could we do differently. Thank you, John. I'd like to hear from the uh, advanced credentialing group. Um, what, what sort of discussion did you have and, and around the area of advanced credentials? Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Um, on advanced credentials was me and Diane and Susan. Um, and we talked um, more specifically about national board certification. Um, and I, we didn't really think of other advanced credentials and we're honestly curious if there were others that maybe we should have looked at. Um, and again, we, we talked about 10 days ago as well. So um, Diane, hop in here if I get any of this um, incorrect. So we ended up actually having a lot, um, our discussion posed a lot more questions for us than we probably have answers or suggestions for the group. Um, but we did wanna hear from specifically the school districts. I know that there was a comment made a few meetings ago about the barriers that exist for that reciprocity for national board certified teachers. Um, currently it's in our um, administrative rules under 1057-410-3D that says a current license from National Board for Professional Teaching Standards in an area approved for endorsement in Montana um, is allowed licensure. And I think if I remember correctly, someone had mentioned that that endorsement in Montana specific language was a barrier. Um, so maybe learning a little bit more about that and what kind of endorsements they've heard were part of the issue. Um, we did notice that the age ranges for endorsements were also different. So wondering if those were some of the barriers um, and then obviously trying to see what we could potentially do to better align those so that um, um, it's a seamless transition. And then um, I think Sue had put, um, and I don't think Sue's on here today. So I don't necessarily want to 
speak for her, but Sue had some notes specifically around, um, you know, local districts not paying for advanced credentials unless it's approved, um, approved policy to do so. Um, and then, you know, leaving those reciprocity decisions to the local uh, school district was a good thing. Um, Dan, do you have anything else to add to that? You know, I, I think you've covered it really well, McCall. We did come up with some questions and I think I'm looking at Julie on screen, but she probably can't tell I'm looking at her. <laughs> and I guess our, I wanted to know specifically if there were particular areas of national board certification um, for which we were unable to grant reciprocity and how often that happens. Do you have specifics on that, Julie? Um, so a couple of things, yeah, Diana would, would have some specifics. So um, when you look at national board certification, right, um, we probably have less than 2% of our teachers that are licensed in the state of Montana that fall under that category. Um, and so national board has their set of endorsements, right? Um, and then we have a set of endorsements that we give certificates for. And so there's been some times, for example, um, somebody go, uh, for, gets national board certified as uh, with a reading specialist in elementary, but we do not have that as a um, endorsement in the state of Montana. So then the question becomes, do you give it to them in elementary or where do you put that endorsement? So sometimes those endorsements don't crosswalk from one to the next completely, if you will. So they're, they're, they're not aligned, directly aligned. Do you, do you also see issues with the grade band endorsements as well? Because the grade band endorsements for national board do not match the grade band. Correct. Endorsements for Montana, right? So the example would be, I could be, and I don't know if I'm exactly right about this, but a rough analogy is I could be three, five endorsed for national board, but Montana doesn't offer a three, five endorsement. So would that transfer then if like, or do you run into problems with that? So then, yeah, you're trying to try to convert it, right? To say, does that mean then that they should be in a early ed K3 or should they be in a K8? because they wouldn't fall under 512. Well, did you say 35? Yeah, so those don't line up directly. It's not, you guys, something that's like, some, um, what I wanted to say, Diane, why I said to you less than 2%, I think is really important is because it's not something that comes up frequently, if, if you will. But when it does, then it kind of causes a little bit of, you know, <laughs> if you will, of trying to figure out, because you don't want to say no, but then which endorsement should they get? And then are you going to make them go back and do something? Those are the kind of questions that I, you know, we, will, we do want to cross walk back and forth and in order to do it properly and to make decisions with it, we probably should do it with some assistance from OPI in terms of what might work best. I mean, I know just next week, we're going to be training a new cadre of um, over 30 people who want to be nationally board certified in Montana in this next in group we're convening. And I would like to make it um, easy for them because these are stellar teachers. And so not, not easy. They've worked real hard to get their national board. And I certainly don't want it to be a problem for them to move forward. So I'd like to work more closely with our committee and whoever and higher ed or OPI, whomever we could add on to do the crosswalking and see what we might do differently. Yeah, Diane, it really does, you know, the national board certification process is quite intensive as you're, as you're indicating. Um, it takes someone, you know, a good, you know, two years really is, I think, about the average to actually go through and do the entire process because it's pretty robust. A lot of portfolio, um, a lot of submission of stuff. Um, so it goes well beyond just, if you will, uh, a, a test or something. It is pretty intense process. 
Yeah, our union provides a, what we call jumpstart program to help folks get prepared and move through that process. There was a question in the chat uh, about why don't we simply align ours to theirs? And I think their bands are often narrow in terms of age ranges. And I know our rural schools can appreciate and teachers who are looking for a job there appreciate that broader uh, band of licensure. So I think that someone else can jump in there and add, but I think that's one reason. I, of course, it would be easier for Montana to change than it would be for us to get national board to change. So I'm looking for what we could do as a state that might make national board requirements trans areas translate better to Montana. Thank you, Diane. Um, I think it, uh, I would ask the question, John, Angela, what would the ramifications of a change of the endorsements do to your preparation programs? Would that cause a ripple effect that would be drastic? Well, Meaning you know, if, if we changed bands, we, we would adjust and, and we would figure it out. It, it would be a, a pretty big undertaking, but um, obviously we prepare people based on well, what the state tells us they're going to license people in. Um, with national boards, I think it's an interesting discussion and, and, and you hear that a lot of, of someone who says I was nationally board certified and I can't get a license here. Um, I guess my question would be what license do they hold in their home state and, and why is that license not transferring in? National board is something you do after you're a licensed teacher. So why are we talking about an after program and not the specific license that they held in the first place? So if we had um, again, going back to that conversation about reciprocity, if we had a different reciprocity system, the national boards is in a terrific add on. Um, and then there's some states that have used national board as a tiered licensing system where you can move up in tiered licensure. And so when we're talking about advanced credentials, that's one of the questions I would have as well is, um, are we looking at those tiered licensure systems as advanced credentials? So if I hold a, a mentoring license from another state or I hold a teacher class two versus a class one, are those what we're talking about for advanced credentials as well? But Jared, yes, we would, we would adopt. It would, it, it would be, it would, it would be difficult to shift from a K eight to a, a K two, three, five, six, eight. Um, but absolutely, we, we would have to do whatever um, the state decided that we did. Is it possible? Uh, to your question, John, to follow up on that, is it possible that some teachers may have obtained an uh, initial license in a state, became national board certified, moved to a state to where their national board certification was just accepted as a license, and then therefore may not have a current license in a state or maybe out of uh, out of date? Is that is that a possibility that could exist? Those who know how national boards work more than I do, I, I don't think your national board. It's not like a license where your license could expire. So if I understand your question, could I hold national board certification but have an expired license in another state? Yes. I mean, you, you certainly could, but I, I, it's my understanding that some teachers may, you know, that the national board essentially becomes their license uh, in place of one that may have expired or if they were simply to just move states, the state may recognize that as a license and they don't have to actually get a state-specific license, so to speak. Yeah, it would be, you know, it'd be really interesting to, to kind of have um, some data that talked about what other states accept in, uh, in lieu of a, of a current license from a state. So who, you know, which states do actually allow that and, and what does that look like? Maybe that's something the national board uh, would be willing to share with us what, what they know from their side of, of where their certification is accepted in lieu of a license. So I'm, I, <laughs> I was a nationally board certified teacher. I got, I earned my certification in 2005. And um, I recall, and I don't know if it's changed, you had to have three years uh, before you could apply and to start the process uh, to become a nationally board certified teacher. Um, if I also recall, and Dean, you just hit the nail on the head, it 
was heavy on pedagogy, heavy on how I taught. Um, and I imagine that is the same irrespective of the grade, um, irrespective of the subject. So I, so I would offer that. I don't believe, and I say this very humbly, that the national board certification is meant to be as a substitute for any educator prep program or any educator prep efforts. Um, it is meant to enhance uh, the ability of an already existing school teacher uh, to do their job and to do it better. And, and I think that that's how I saw it. I, I believe that that's how the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards um, is, is still using it. Um, all of that said, uh, I think we, we're, we broached on a couple of really interesting things today. I mean, the notion of removing the praxis uh, based on all of the important conversations and the data. I do think that there is a role for national board certification uh, in our licensure. Perhaps, what I would offer again very humbly, uh, that role might be best in, in adding it to, to other pieces or in, as John Melick mentioned, uh, a tiered uh, licensure structure. Uh, further, um, I think that anybody who would come into Montana if they were a nationally board certified teacher, they could present credentials uh, of an endorsement or endorsements earned that OPI could assess um, outside of anything that they might have uh, presented as far as their national boards. And I, and I think that that's the already existing model. Um, so I think that we're talking about a lot of really good things. And I, and I do go back to that notion of that tiered or that graduated licensure. And, and I would ask folks, it is in, it, as to how could we use those pieces. And then one other piece that I would just like to point to uh, from the last conversation was, I think it was Dean also put in the, in the conversation, this notion of providing whether it was military spouses or whether it was providing anyone coming in from out of state, uh, the support that they would need uh, once they did get their licensure were in the classroom, uh, providing that support through our campuses or through the RISAs um, as he indicated in the chat. So I think that we've got a lot to consider here. Um, I'd love to learn more if the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards has changed anything around, but I do think that you have something very good there that you can measure strong pedagogy if folks have, have gotten that process and, and gotten through it successfully. So I, so I really like that, but I don't think that its intent was to, to substitute any EPP or any, uh, any endorsements that a teacher would have earned. Yeah, just to clarify, you guys. So um, you can get if you're you can get a license in Montana uh, through the pathway of having a national board certificate. So if you had that, then you wouldn't need to take. And you're coming from out of state. You wouldn't need to take a, a praxis exam. You would not need to demonstrate and provide a university recommendation um, from your educator preparation program. Uh, show um, those pieces. The national board, you would just you need, need to take the EFA, but you wouldn't have to show demonstration of all that other stuff. That's kind of how it's used, if you will. Which is the most common practice for states is to, it gives you a leg up towards obtaining the license, so to speak. Dean, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Yes, I did, but I think I got my question answered. Thanks. So we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, the Alternative Pathways group, I uh, would love to hear from your discussion. Uh, yeah, Alternative Pathways, we had a, we had a several different discussions about possibilities and, and what that could look like. Um, my brain is just really circling on this military spouses at the second, so I need to kind of re recollect um, 
and and I'm looking forward to that discussion. Uh, but we talked about, you know, are, are we talking about creating um, new alternative pathways in Montana? Are we talking about um, recognizing alternative pathways from other states? And, uh, you know, we, we talked about that five year uh, in that language that exists now versus uh, three years that exists in all the other language. And, um, the, you know, consistency across areas is important. Um, none of us were in our group, none of us were, were on the um, groups that decided that five years was a benchmark for that. So we're a little unclear where five years came from or why we didn't stick with three like we do in administrative language or uh, any other, you know, tenure or any other uh, language that we use across the state. Um, we did talk if, if there were some room for uh, alternative pathways in Montana and, and what that might look like for um, uh, producing new programs in Montana that, that um, could attract a different, uh, a different uh, population of teachers or might provide a new avenue for people to come in a different way. Um, so we just kind of looked at those different pieces. Um, but we did talk a lot about that, that five-year versus three-year. And then uh, again, if we thought about this as creating alternative pathways, what would that look like? How would that impact um, traditional programs as far as, you know, would there be room for them to innovate and do things differently? Um, maybe some incentives for uh, programs. And then um, even if there were ways currently for some of our uh, higher ed programs to partner with non-traditional programs uh, to create new programs that, that meet Montana um, standards for licensure in a different way uh, by partnering with, with groups. So um, lots of different thoughts there and, and uh, Angela or, or Dean, if there were things that you wanted to add. additional information, Angela or Dean? <laughs> yes. So we um, we did uh, just process this, and I spent a lot of time since last week kind of even crafting some language just so I could really process um, everything that that, um, that that we were thinking. And John did did an excellent uh, an excellent job. Um, you know, part of what what we you know what I settled on, I think what. John and I settled on, I think, was this notion that we need to use, um, can we use this opportunity to get teachers where they are needed um, as per the high need list or the Montana quality educator critical shortage list? Can we use an opportunity through tiered licensure, through any of what we've discussed, alternative pathways? Um, to get them there and to keep them there and to support them there. And so I think, uh, Val, Val, with your conversation about the military spouses, um, it applies here. Uh, for any school district leader who is on uh, this Zoom today, who is struggling to find a teacher uh, from out of state, a, a teacher uh, who, who might be licensed somewhere else and be a military spouse, um, take all of those situations. How can we use this process um, uh, and think outside the box to get them there? And can we incentivize them staying there uh, through through these pathways? Um, so really think about the whole the whole conversation as as maybe alternate to to what we've done, so that we remove barriers. Maybe do something to incentivize folks going to these critical areas staying there and supporting them there while they're uh, being inducted to that new school district, uh, to that new community, making sure that they have the infrastructure um, there to do that. So um, that's really uh, what we talked about. Uh, we, we talked, you know, we too even considered the national board certification, uh, you know, as, as an opportunity if we offered um, an alternative license to the two um, for an out of state person uh you know maybe going uh if they had the national boards we had talked about the notion of going right to a um right to a a, a two uh, a, a class two 
And so now that I've, I've opened up that, one of the things that, that you know, I just broached uh, briefly with John was a notion of, of a 2A for folks, for all folks who come in so that we start this tiered licensure conversation so that we make sure that they have the supports that they need right from the start, wherever they would teach. Um, and so that we're not just uh, saying, okay, you can come into Montana, you don't have to have any experience, three years, five years, or even a single year, we're gonna accept you, you can go anywhere and you're not gonna have any support once you get here. Um, what we wanted to do, I think, through our conversations was, was develop some pathways uh, whereby a person could get licensure, um, but the licensure office could at the outset have an assurance on that path uh, that, that you would have the support that you needed uh, in the district, uh, maybe some provided by EPPs or whatever. Um, so, so I think that there, there's a lot here. Um, let's see. Um, one of the things that we did talk about was the notion, the difference between um, uh, the compact and, and maybe John wants to speak to that a little bit better. Um, a little bit more, um, and I don't want to put them on the spot at all, but the, uh, let's see, the interstate plan versus the compact, maybe John wants to speak just a little bit more to that, but I think at the end of the day, I think there's promise in everything that we're talking about, um, but if we're going to tell out-of-state folks who come to Montana from another EPP where we don't know what they have learned and what they haven't learned, that they can come here without any any experience or three years when it used to be five or whatever, then let's shore it up on the other end. Let's say, okay, we're going to give you a license, uh, but we're going to make sure that you have the support you need, not only to, to go into a district, but to support there if you, to stay there. And maybe even an incentive through what we would write here to stay there so that you can move into a full class two, then eventually to a full class one. Uh, something so so a lot to chew on there um, and John do you want to add to that conversation about the interstate plan versus the compact yeah I, I think that I, I just posted a, a, a article from the military times about this and there is a a, a long NASDAQ um, video that they did where they had a panel together talking about this um, but I, I think this would go under that um, military spouses, and then it, it does dovetail into a larger discussion about reciprocity because they're looking to create licensure compacts, um, again, to make it easier for people to transfer from state to state um, instead of kind of, you know, one-offing where Montana says we're going to do this and we're going to do that. It, it's really around that national discussion about making it easier for people. And, and while this is, is really geared from military spouses, it would impact the entire uh, profession because obviously you don't just make licensing easier for one group of people. If you if you do this, you, it works for everybody. So um, again, I think that's a really important discussion that, that we should be paying attention to. And, and if we're not at the table, seeing how we get at the table for that. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And licensure and, and welcome folks into Montana, embrace them with open arms and, and say, we, we really are glad that you're here and support them into our most rural uh, communities where there are some of the most significant uh, struggles to recruit and retain teachers and then provide that alternative pathway in to licensure and then provide a pathway to supporting them uh, throughout that first year and that second year so that we um, so, so that we can see uh, uh, a different um, I, I guess uh, so that we can see a change in, in some of the data that we're looking at when it comes to educator recruitment and retention across the state. Thank you, Angela. We, we are again running up against our time because we do have such rich discussions. We have two minutes. Um, so I will promise that we will begin the next meeting with the endorsements group. So if you guys, we're going to push you almost two weeks away from what may have been your initial discussion. Uh, please take some notes. Sean, I see you have a hand up real quick. Want to get yeah, you Yeah, in? just really, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, just really quickly as we kind of walk away from this, 
um, let me just kind of, and then correct me if, if I walk away with this from this with the wrong idea. First of all, I, I think that it seems like we, we are in agreement that there's barriers, um, made some major barriers out there. From the, over the last couple of weeks, we've, discuss, we've decided that a flow chart or a job aid around these processes might be helpful because, because they're, they're very confusing actually. Um, you know, it depends upon which, you know, this is the process for Tuesday and this is the process for Thursday. My apologies, I exaggerate that point. Um, there's also a question around the years of experience required for other state teachers. I think that's a valid conversation. Um, you know, and then the, the National Board certification is a great, is a great conversation around that. Uh, the discussion today is around, you know, considering the, the dropping of practice for other state applicants. Um, I think that's a great conversation. And then finally, I just wanted to point out as a person and, and, and several of us on this committee are, um, we're in that role of hiring teachers. And, and you know, we're, just, we're discussing the licensure, but local control is important. And, and I really, as far as the board members, you know, as far in my role as a board member uh, and, and several roles as a board member, you know, I really trust our superintendents and administration to make really good hiring decisions. So, so I, you know, we can talk about licensure, uh, but, but again, it is licensure and, and we're not gonna hire and our, and our superintendents and admins will not hire um, you know, people who we feel are not qualified. So I just kind of wanted to kind of summarize that. Is that an incorrect summarization? Um, and, and the final point of that is just around for, in my role, as that person that hires people uh, is, you know, that, that's my perspective around that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. I certainly heard that uh, theme throughout too. That's where we are. So we uh, will be working behind the scenes to capture all of the discussion this week and last week. Um, the goal being we can come back, have the quick endorsement discussion. Tristan was kind enough to alert me that we actually don't have an endorsement group. So we'll just have a short open discussion on endorsements. Uh, the topic of that really is uh, open to you. But in this conversation today, we touched on uh, do they need to adjust sort of in terms of grade level uh, content specialty or is the current broad setting perfect or what flexibility may be there to help with um, licensing for teachers who may already have a license. Um, and then we'll look at uh, what we will try to bring forward as sort of the high level points that everybody has made of places for um, leverage to reduce those barriers and try to reach some consensus on kind of those those big kind of specifics where we can dig in see if there's anything that we've missed that we wanna tackle and then we should be ready then to just really identify next steps. And that may be again, that there's more higher level topics we need to identify or it could be that we're ready to move into some specifics that will be determined through our conversation. But we certainly have identified through coursework, uh, assessments, uh, thinking about flexibility for military spouses and advanced credentials areas where we can begin to target that we didn't have two weeks ago. And Jacob, really quick, uh, before you close out on endorsements, uh, it's really important that people um, take a look at that there's only one way to earn an endorsement in Montana, um, and that is to go to school and have a university recommendation on it. So there is somewhat of some, some pieces around endorsements that are important. For example, if you are endorsed in science um, and you are working in a small rural high school and you wanna teach mathematics, the only way you can add that endorsement is to um, have coursework that you've attended from an EPP. Um, so I just bring that forward. Um, also around that conversation for endorsements is some folks come in from out of state and have a history background, get a university recommendation for history and can't qualify for a broadband social studies without going back to school. Um, or taking a test or showing experience, which makes it very difficult for them because um, the chances of them being in a high school in the state of Montana where they only teach history probably is not realistic. So that said, I just say for endorsements, there's a lot there. Take a look at it. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Any closing thoughts before we dismiss for today and go on our way?
Uh, Julie, we well, Go uh, ahead. So, sorry, Jacob, uh, I wasn't finding my raised hand. Will you be here next week, Julie? Not to put you on the spot, but uh, I guess if I'll not. Try. Okay. Um, I'll try. I'm actually um, so excited. We're going to be having a summit working with our comprehensive schools in Billings in person. We have over 200 and some um, school people with us. So I'm, um, I can make it happen. If it, like what time on Thursday, you guys, it's at one. Um, sorry, you guys don't wait on me. Let's see here. Wednesday, Thursday, I'm looking at my agenda. Um, yeah, I should be able to, I can. Well, I'm just thinking like the chapter 58 task force this morning really kind of got uh, into discussion of endorsements as well. And I think you're previewing that it's a pretty complex area. So, uh, you know, not that you have to come just for this, but, you know, if there's any homework people sh could do to prepare for that, um, if there's any other OPI staff who really know endorsements well, I just wonder if you know, just so we can be well informed to dive into what could be a more technical piece than I think some of us are expecting it to be. Okay. Uh, see, I'll meet Eric. I'll talk with you and Jacob behind the scenes um, and then definitely be ready to kind of maybe present some things around endorsement. Yes. You're bringing up a really key point. The entire system is built around endorsements. So it's a really critical uh, pivoting piece. John could probably also really um, allude to that, but it really determines so much around what your preparation program is. It drives your coursework. It it drives your setting for your student teaching. It's a really, really critical piece. So um, I just share that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jacob, I just have one thing before you close and for you to maybe bring to the focus. Um, one of the things that I keep I hope is resonating from what I'm saying is that is this is how can we use this process of licensure to aid in the recruitment and retention efforts across the state and I think that that's what we're all here uh, about. Um, but not only how can we bring somebody in, but how can we support them in staying and uh, not only can we uh, bring them into a rural district, but how can we support them or incentivize them to stay. We have a lot of pieces and parts that are moving. Uh, and I think that they're putting us on a trajectory towards the, in the right direction. Uh, and hopefully uh, together they will uh, aid in getting us to a better place on this front. Uh, educator salaries, uh, we have the grow your own uh, efforts in place, things happening on our ed prep programs, et cetera. But I think uh, the question that I would just ask all of the folks on this committee, as well as the focus group to consider is how can we use this licensure mechanism to aid in that and not just fix one piece of it in getting folks here with a license and sending them off to wherever they would get hired by an independent uh, local board of trustees. But how can we use this process to incentivize them to stay or to support them uh, through the induction process in a, in a new district? Thanks. Thank you, Angela. Anything else? Last thoughts, final words? Okay. We will break and we will see you again next week. Look for some specific notes. Um, no homework outside of everybody becoming an expert on the endorsements by next week. And, but uh, we'll definitely have some notes to look at that'll drive our discussion move us forward. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you again next week.